the whole point of your meta-analysis is to take a load of different papers and get the same numbers from those papers for your thing, whatever it is, the intervention you're studying. The three critical ones, which you can't do anything if you don't have these three, are the number of subjects, the mean and the standard deviation. You, if there's no evidence in the paper that those things exist, you, you can stop there. But you can recreate these things from lots, you can recreate or you can es estimate them from, from lots of other things. So if you know the number of subjects and you have a t-test, for example, then you can work out the other two things. Outline of this bit is um, hopefully you've got some papers, you know where to find papers. Extracting the metadata, that's really up to you. Um, what, what things do you need to know about your papers in order to in include or exclude them? The hard part is um, extracting the data you need from the paper. The relatively easy part after you've got the data from the paper is to convert them. And that's what we've just done in the, the Excel sheet. So if you can take any set of numbers and use those various formula to convert them between one and another, then you're good. The third bit is really the, the main job. Hopefully you know where to find papers. I made this little flowchart. I usually start with the DOI now. I think that's pretty much universal. It used 10 years ago, it wasn't at all. So it's really changed. It's excellent. The DOI is, is your go-to uh, internet reference. And then ideally you get the full, full paper. If you can't get it online, maybe try your university. If your university is no good, maybe try the interlibrary loan, which I discovered a couple of months ago and they're amazing. In Birmingham, it's really good. You just put in your PubMed ID into the interlibrary loan. It finds the paper, you click yes. And then within, within 24 hours, you know, the University of California has sent you a PDF. It's, it's amazing. So I think these three steps alone, you get 95 or 99% of the papers you need if your library, if you have a university library subscription. So, and if, if none of those work, still possible, maybe Google Scholar, maybe ResearchGate, maybe email someone and then Whatever you do, you definitely shouldn't use Sci-Hub. That's really a terrible thing to do. So definitely don't, don't use that. Once you've got the paper, that's all good. Hopefully, if you've done your planning correctly, you should know what you're looking for in the paper. So you should just be, be able to ignore the, ignore the gloss and the, uh, the introduction and the discussion. Just go straight in, get the bibliographic data you need. It might be PubMed IDs, DOIs, the name of the authors, the year, the lab, the country, whatever you need for your to, to narrate your, your work. Um, you probably want to know that who or what is being tested in your paper. So species, which groups, age, sex, any medical conditions, and then whatever else you need to categorize your data. Most important thing is probably the design in terms of meta-analysis. Are you comparing two time points in the same people or two different groups of people? Possibly both. So the metadata, pretty straightforward. The numerical data also should be straightforward. You can, if you need text, so text and tables sometimes work all right. You can just copy and paste from the PDFs or HTMLs, but sometimes you copy and paste numbers from there and they just get messed up. The encoding's wrong or the tabulation is all wrong. I often find myself just re retyping it into the spreadsheet or something myself, and that's obviously error, error prone. Ideally, the data would be all stored in a nice table in a nice text file, which you could just download, but we're not there yet. It's more and more common, but we're not there yet. And then when you're reading the paper, you need to look out for your key measurements. So the means or medians for your conditions, any measure of dispersion at all. So it could be a standard deviation, standard error, confidence interval, interquartile range, or some other kind of range. All of those are useful. And if you've got them, you should extract them. And then if you've got any inferential statistics as well. So most people will report a T, a P, an F, or an R. Uh, sometimes people give you the D value as well, and sometimes they even calculate it correctly. So that's good. But whatever you take out of the article, you should just assume that it's not correct until you've proven otherwise. So be very skeptical about everything you extract. And the more you, the more data you take, the more likely you can um, cross check and take two independent numbers to get the same, the same result. I would say this is all papers probably. Once you've decided on what your question is, um, almost no papers will give you exactly what you want. So you're gonna have to need to extract data and convert it or to extract data from the figures. Rather than talking you through it, I'm just gonna show you. Right, so here, this is one of the papers from my current meta-analysis that I just found last week. So here's an exciting looking paper. I'm going to open the PDF. Let's assume I've read all this. I've extracted the numbers that I need from the, from the tables, but unfortunately they, the only way they present the data that I want is in a graph. And maybe the website, you can't download the figure directly or you can't download a high resolution. So basically, I'm just going to zoom into the graph, take a screenshot, and then going to open my GIMP. 
which uh, GIMP's great, it's free and works on all platforms. I'm currently using it. This is a, a Linux computer. It works very well on Windows as well. Yeah, so this is what I normally do. Um, if you have a better screenshot app, you can get it straight off the screen. I'm going to save myself a bit of space by converting it to a grayscale. And then I'm going to just save it. There we go. So now I've got um, that's so that's the data I want to extract. So we've got um, two conditions in this case. One of the, one of the groups or one of the conditions the subjects have been given dopamine. And another one they've been given a placebo. This is a nice graph because I've got two time points before and after. I've got two groups, can, uh, drug and no drug, and I've got the y-axis. And the good thing about this graph is they give me all the data or most of it. And um, so all those individual dots are the individual subjects. I've got the means of the crosses in the middle. I've got the um, probably the interquartile ranges on these on these box plots. So that's probably the um, the outliers, and then the interquartile ranges, the median. So basically, this is ideal. This this graph, it's a good example. That's why I picked it. is It's got everything you need apart from one thing. And you want to guess what that one thing is? What's missing from this sort of repeated measures intervention? What would you ideally want from these graphs that you haven't got on this one? Can you then do a within subjects t-test on these data? Yeah, I'll save your save your machinations. The answer is no, you can't because you don't know which subject. This dot here, you don't know which which other dot that's related to. So you've got the individual data for each condition, and that's great. It's more than most papers will give you. There'll be a p-value in the paper somewhere, but the best thing you could have is a line connected e connecting each of these dots with the same dot from from the same participant. So if there are loads of lines connecting these dots, then you have everything you need. Unfortunately, almost no one does that, um, but you should. That's what I do with figures wise. I just zoom in, get the best figure at the best resolution. And then um, I use this thing called G3 data. It's only works on Linux. So you'll have to use something else like web plot digitizer, for example. On all of these plot digitizers, what you need to do is load a nice high resolution figure. Then you need to put your put X and Y positions on the graph. So when I'm doing the X axis, if there's no, if it's not a numerical scale, if it's categorical, I'll just choose the, the most distant points and call that zero, say, I'm going to call that five. So I've got a scale of zero to five. It doesn't matter because they're categorical and I can just extract the data later. And then you put labels on the Y axis. So I'm going to go from, this is more important. So if you look at the zoom in bit on the left, I'm going to call that zero because that's zero. And then I'm going to call that two. I've done this probably a hundred thousand times for <laughs> data points over my career. So it's, um, if anyone tells me there's a fully automated re way to do this, I'll be very angry, but um, I, I, I don't believe there is. Once you've lined up your axes, you've, you've got your dots on your axis telling the program where the data should be. You can then just check that when you put your, when you put your cursor on say, zero one that the data you get at the top up here is zero one which is close enough and then you just uh, click away and start clicking on dots and extracting data and um, this is the time consuming part if you haven't got some sort of better way of doing it which i don't think you do and um, so i would just click on all the dots and then export the data into a text file and there it is and you get x and y those two set of data and um, yeah, I probably spend about an hour. So on, on the meta-analysis that I've recently done, I've spent an hour per paper um, extracting data. So if, you've, if you're if you doing a meta-analysis with 20 papers, maybe that's a week's work um, to extract the data carefully and check it and get it in the format you want. Um, if you're doing stupidly 400 papers like I am, uh, that's a year's, a year's work. It's not, not like, not full time, but it's like, distribute it amount amongst the year. It's um it's a lot of work. Ideally, data is in text or tables. If it's not, uh, or if you want to cross check or double check or you don't really believe the text or tables, um, you're gonna need an image editor, ed edit the image, open it in whichever um highest resolution format you can. And then there are these other tools um which if you don't have a Linux computer then either of these should should be good. Hopefully you can use learn to use one of them i've tried using this one i didn't get very far because i i didn't have time but it should be i've heard people use it it's really great so you just load in the image i don't know if this is going to work but um let's see shall we 
there we go yeah i don't know what to do i don't know what to do there <laughs> so so that's what i would advise that's what most people are doing um it's on the web so you don't need to download any software um it, i think it's pretty much the same thing you you find the data points you want and you select them and then output them so web plot digitizer wpd is what what the cool kids are using i'm old school so i'm still using uh, a linux version there's another one called plot digitizer app um, I haven't used it, but um, hopefully you can. And then once you, <clears throat> yeah, you output the data and you, you're just looking for, if you're trying to extract the data that someone's reported, you just, you're going to end up with a bunch of numbers and then you need to extract what you need from those numbers. And it could be, you take the average of all the Y values, for example, for these conditions and not that, that condition. And once you've got all the raw data, you can then get the raw, the means, the standard deviations, you can get everything you need that won't be reported in the paper necessarily. So I'm just going to give you some examples of, as I've spent way too much time looking at other people's graphs and trying to get data from them. So this is like a, a crash course in how do you make a good graph and what the problems you'll find in trying to get people's data out. So I've given them a star rating from zero stars to five stars down here. So here's one. It's all from the same meta-analysis. Uh, it looks all right, um, but how do you work out which error bar belongs to which data point? The error bars are all the same. And they're completely overlapping. Sometimes you can see all six hats on the error bars. Sometimes you've only got five. It took me about an hour to work out which error bars related to which data points. Um, and then I wasn't I wasn't completely certain. So it looks all right. Lo loads and loads of graphs look like this, but it's very difficult to get the variability that you want from that data. So that's a zero stars. Here's a very typical error bar produced in, in Excel, I think. Um, it looks okay. You can got the you got the error bars. You can, you can extract those points. You got the means, but um, on the black one, you can't see the bottom half of the error bar. So your estimate of they should be symmetrical. They're not always symmetrical. That's uh, one common error. Um, they should be symmetrical. Um, so you can't work out. It's slightly hard to work out that one. It's not a terrible mistake, but the error bars are difficult to see on that one. And also, they haven't given you all the, all the raw data anyway. So. Um, it's not that great. So not very good. This is like a guide to how to produce nice looking graphs in science. Um, so that's one star. Uh, lots of bar, error bars are like this. So some of them have negative error bars and some of them positive. That's fine. They're thinking about the reader. Um, that's that's all fine. But the problem is when when they overlap, um, this, this data point no longer has an error bar. So you can't work out. You can say it's a maximum of, of about that much, but you can't tell for sure what the error bar is there. So the solution is just to offset the data so that they're not exactly overlapping. Um, you always need to see all of the error bars for every point. This one's getting better. We're starting to get individual data now. So you've got three conditions in this one. These are, I think, Parkinson's disease, old and a different kind of old. It's definitely better. You can now get all the individual data on X and, on X and Y axes. But how many data points are buried in this cluster? There could be five, there could be six or seven or eight, we don't know. Um, so because they're large symbols, um, you can no longer tell how many data points there are and where they are. Um, and when I tried to extract these data, there was there was some missing data points. And you have to kind of assume that there are two data points here, et cetera, et cetera. So um, whatever you do in your data, in your graphs, just please make them, make your data visible. <laughs> Box plots, lots of people like box plots. I'm not a, big, not a big fan, but at least in this case, all of the box plots are completely visible. So you've got your uh, extreme values, quartile one, the median, quartile three. So if you're gonna do a box plot, fair enough. Um, but in this case, at least, at least I can see everything. So that's good. And then close to the ideal is, this is my favorite graph that I've seen recently. So there's everything here, um, you've got, Two different groups. So this is Parkinson's disease on the left, older adults on the right. Every individual subject, you can see the data points. You can see when they overlap. There's two there. Um, they've jit they've jittered the data left and right so that if there is any overlap, you can still see where the individual data points are. So in every single case, I was able to extract every single data point that I needed. I think there's 89 or something in here. Um, and then along with the, the individual dots, you've also got their box plots. So you've got their estimates of the quartiles, the mean in dot, in a dotted line, the medians and the box plots. 
Um, so the, yeah, that's that's the ideal graph. You can't you can't do any better than that graph for the, for a two group design. If if this was one group, you'd want lines connecting the individual dots for the same subjects. But um, but this is as good as it gets, as far as I can tell. Yeah, so that's what you're aiming for. Um, produce graphs like that and extract data from from those kind of figures wherever you can. Take as much data as you can get from your papers because you will find lots and lots of errors. You'll find scatter plots where there's missing data. I was doing a review a couple of weeks ago and I said, why are there only 11 points in figure 2a? And, and they said, oh yeah, sorry, we must, must have missed off the 12th point. This is like, you know, the final figure after years of work and they've missed off one of the data points. So plots very often have missing points. Uh, error bars are often just wrong, often asymmetrical, like the top error bar is bigger or smaller than the bottom error bar. This one, extremely common, people say it's standard deviation and actually it's standard error or vice versa. Um, I think between these three, I'd say probably 20% of papers have, have one of these errors in. Yeah, I think it's, it's really, really, really common and unhelpful. So you have to take whatever you can do to try and fix these problems, you have to try and fix them. This is a, that's just another Excel sheet that, um, so when I get my data from say here, I can copy and paste my data into there and, oops, that didn't work. Yeah, so I've pasted I've pasted three values in, uh, sorry, four four values into there, and then from this thing I can if I'm if I just want two two numbers I can extract those two numbers which just processes the data from those raw data points so I can get what I need. That's just a reminder: all the things you can do to recreate the data you actually want, whether it's central tendency dispersion or inferential statistics. That's just a reminder. You could practice on some own papers if you want but the idea is go through a, a paper you care about try and recreate the stats that they've they've reported and yeah so when you're when you're extracting data from figures you're looking for basically something like this so a bit of metadata to tell you what you're interested in sample size effect size that could be Cohen's d standard deviation standard error t deep degrees of freedom if you can get all of this from your papers about the critical effect size that you need, that's it, you've got everything. And, and really the, at minimum, you just need those three columns. That's the absolute minimum you need to get. I could take this and do a meta analysis on that. And that's all I need, those four columns, you know, a label, sample size and effect size and a standard deviation. But to get those numbers, you'll very often have to extract other numbers from, from the paper.